It's good to have you with us for France 24, special coverage of the Indian election under Lana D'Souza, and this is India Votes. Two polling phases to go before the largest democratic exercise on earth comes to an end in the final stretch. A shift in strategy from the main opposition, Congress President Rahul Gandhi going on a media offensive as he tries to drive Narendra Modi out of a job. Let's go across to New Delhi and join correspondent Mandakini Galot. Mandakini, why is Rahul Gandhi opening up now this late in the game? And is it a strategy that's working? Yes, Delano. Uh, he has emerged as quite an aggressive uh, campaigner. And in fact, he's made a spectacular turnaround over the last uh, 18 months or so, having honed his public speaking and communication uh, skills. But for several years before that, he was an object of uh, political uh, ridicule, especially for his political rivals. Prime Minister Modi's Bharatiya Janata Party often accused him of being a lightweight. And to be honest, as the son, grandson, and great-grandson of former Indian prime ministers. Um, he has always been accused of nepotism. But at a time when uh, farmers and small businesses in India are hurting because of Prime Minister Modi's signature economic policies and hate crimes against uh, minority religious groups are on the rise, uh, his party is more inclusive and secular uh, messaging is starting to resonate with people once again. He has also been burnishing his Hindu credentials by going on visits to several temples. But beyond all that, he has also proposed uh, very attractive policy proposals. For example, his uh, policy proposal uh, that promises a minimum income guarantee scheme that will transfer about 80 euros to India's poorest 20 percent every month. If implemented properly, the scheme could dramatically transform the lives of over 50 million families. His party has also proposed uh, other progressive measures, for example, getting rid of or abolishing a sedition law that Prime Minister Modi's government has sometimes used to uh, silence dissenters. So there's a lot there. But as to whether this media blitz is working, uh, it's hard to say. But let's keep in mind that Rahul Gandhi did lead uh, the Congress party to victory in three key states only last December, demonstrating that he has the ability to draw voters to the polling booth. Now, whether that will work at the national level, we'll just have to wait till May 23rd to find out. Indeed, uh, just under three weeks away. Thank you very much for that, Mandakini. Mandakini Gallup reporting there for us from New Delhi. Now, as Mandakini was saying, India is facing its worst unemployment crisis in over 40 years. The job creation record of the current government is bleak. Last year, over 10 million jobs were lost, and it's driving people to extremes. France 24, Shreya Banerjee and Thomas Denis travel to Bhopal in central India to witness the extent of the crisis. In this neighborhood in the central Indian city of Bhopal, Nitesh Yadav, a young father of two, hanged himself last December. His mother Lakshmi was the last person to see him alive. Nitesh, the sole earner in his family, lost his job in 2018. Unable to find a new one, he struggled to provide for his family. The situation three months before his death drove him to depression. He was really intelligent and a very capable person. In this state, unemployment amongst educated youth increased by 53 percent between 2016 and 2018. Despite having a business degree, 27-year-old Vinod hasn't been able to find a suitable job and is working at a grocery store. I dreamt of being an accountant. For seven long years, I tried to get a job. I gave so many interviews, but it didn't work out, so I ended up working in the shop instead. In his free time, Vinod volunteers with the Army of the Unemployed, a group that helps graduates without jobs. Graduates, postgraduates who have been applying for government jobs and private jobs, but not able to find anything. He believes that the current government's failure to create jobs will influence the votes of young people. The country's unemployment stands at 6.1 percent, the highest it's been since the 1970s. When the BJP government, Modi Sarkar, actually came into power, they said that they'll create two crore jobs per year. And in fact, instead of creating more jobs because of demonetization, because of crony capitalism and because of poor policies, actually, they reduced the number of jobs. Akshay and his army have lost faith in the BJP government and have thrown their weight behind the Congress, the main opposition party. 
They're hoping that a change in government will signal a change in their fortunes. On the show this week, we're also going to discuss the state of India's foreign policy. And for that, we can go across to New Delhi and speak to Tanvi Madan, director of the India Project at Brookings. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Now, traditionally, India has marched to the beat of its own drum when it comes to foreign policy. Is that still the case? Yes, very much so. One of the things, while uh, Prime Minister Modi has talked a lot about how he has changed things. We've actually seen more continuity in Indian foreign policy uh, than the rhetoric would suggest. Uh, India continues to not want to uh, uh, join any alliances, but it does have very close partnerships now uh, with the US, for example, uh, with some countries in Europe, including France, um, as well as kind of adversarial relationships that have been challenging for India with countries like China and Pakistan. Uh, India is also continuing its relationship with Russia to an extent uh, even though that country is now perhaps uh, closer uh, to Indian rival China. Now, now Tadvi, in the past few days, India has lost the ability to purchase Iranian oil without facing the threat of U.S. sanctions. Uh, I mean, how easy did New Delhi, you know, give up? Um, what, they would have tried to avoid uh, uh, being part of, kind of coming under these sanctions. They were hoping for an extension. They got one sanctions waiver uh, last autumn. Uh, they were hoping for another one uh, this spring. Uh, but I think they were preparing uh, for the fact that they wouldn't get another extension to this waiver to be able to import a certain amount, a reduced amount of Iranian oil. Um, so they would have been prepared uh, to get other alternatives. That's become easier for India to do. Uh, because it's been, uh, with prices not above $100, uh, it's something that is more affordable for them than, you know, from five or seven years ago. That was always harder. Plus, uh, they have uh, other suppliers like Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Iraq, uh, and the U.S. willing to sell to them and wanting uh, to increase their market share in India. So they are going to give them better deals. Uh, finally, the U.S. relationship is important for India uh, because of the challenge that China poses. The U.S. is an important economic partner. And so India would not have wanted to seem like they were trying to get around uh, the sanction system uh, through, uh, for example, a rupee payment scheme or something like that. Uh, the other thing is there are a lot of Indian companies who are involved in the processes that are all have exposure uh, to the U.S. and would not want to compromise that. Now, I wanted to ask you, how has India's relationship changed with the United States uh, since the arrival of Donald Trump? Because you see, he's not as close to uh, the current U.S. president, uh, Prime Minister Modi is not as close to the current U.S. president as, say, he was with uh, the pre his predecessor, uh, Barack Obama, and he's not as close to him as he is with other populists like Bibi Netanyahu. Uh, um, uh, they, they don't have a, a great relationship, but they don't have a bad one either. This is not a uh, kind of antagonistic relationship. Uh, Prime, President Trump has also kind of thought of Prime Minister Modi as a winner, quote unquote, um, which he quite likes. Uh, he's familiar with India. Uh, but more on kind of a policy level, I would say the relationship has kind of moved on two tracks. Uh, there's a positive side, a positive track, and I would say I would highlight the defense and security uh, relationship, which even in the last two years has actually proceeded quite, uh, quite uh, significantly and continued to progress. Uh, the one thing that I think the U.S. would have liked to see uh, is a big defense deal going to the um, to 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 the uh, U.S. company. We haven't seen that yet, but we might after the election, depending on who's. Uh, in power in Delhi. Uh, but there's a more kind of, there's one side that has had more friction, which is on uh, the trade side. Uh, India and the U.S. are talking about uh, talking about some of their trade disputes right now. Uh, India has reduced its deficit, uh, which is not anywhere near the size of the deficit that the U.S. has with China. It is less than one-tenth the amount, uh, significantly less than that. Uh, but nonetheless, it's something uh, that has annoyed President Trump. But it's also a long-standing issue uh, that American policymakers and companies have had with India, both on the trade and investment front, where they think of India as protectionist. Having said that, you see some large American companies like Amazon, like Uber, like Walmart, who are in, and companies like Boeing and Lockheed, who see India as a large market and are continuing to be optimistic about it. So I would say uh, the first two years of the Trump administration, there are some pluses and some minuses. Uh, India would see itself also as kind of uh, better off having not uh, been the subject of 
too many tweets uh, from the president. Good point. We're going to have to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today. It's time to hear it directly from a voter in India next, thanks to our team at the France 24 Observers. India is experiencing its worst water crisis ever. Rivers and reservoirs have dried up as agriculture continues to use up a huge portion of the country's water supply. A 2018 report by a government think tank found that 70% of India's water is contaminated and that 20 cities, including Bangalore and Delhi, are at risk of running out of groundwater as early as next year. Our observer this week is Amir Abdul. Bas. He's a community journalist in Patna, the capital of one of India's poorest states. He writes about rural zones in India and tells us about the severe lack of clean drinking water and toilet facilities in the con- for the country's most marginalized communities. Patna want clean and hygienic drinking water facilities. If you go to Adalat Kanj or Kamla Nehru Nagar or any slum areas in Patna, we don't have water facility. The water supplied to them are very dirty and unhygienic. Just suppose a labor family which hardly earns 30 to 40 rupees a day, uh, how can they afford to buy clean water for drinking uh, which costs 20 rupees per liter? The second thing we want in this elections to enhance our educational facility. Many girl students in Patna drop their schooling uh, after 8th class because of not having separate toilets in school. Many communities in Patna which populates around 1200 to 1500 is dependent on only one toilet in, in their area. We have to cast our vote only for the development of our communities. That's it for this edition of India Votes. You can also find the show on our website, france24.com. From all of us on the team, thank you very much for watching.